I am increasingly convinced that almost all of our experience in life somehow uh, is formulated in the form of a story. Uh, whether it be in novels or literature, uh, in the way that we write history, in the way we talk about our politics, uh, there's just so much in our understanding of the world that comes from storytelling. And today, we're going to hear about some of that storytelling. Uh, Professor Bailuna Danraje has been at BYU now for um, over five years. This is her sixth year here. Uh, she teaches in the Portuguese department. She teaches courses in the cultures of Brazil, uh, in uh, Portuguese literature as well. Um, and uh, she's a very prolific author. She's uh, very published really widely. She's uh, interested primarily in contemporary Brazilian literature, but looking at uh, how that Brazilian literature treats uh, different historical periods, including representation of minority groups, uh, and that will be part of her subject today. Um, she uh, graduated with her PhD in 2015 uh, in Brazil at the Universidade Estadual Paulista, or U UNESP, and we're very grateful uh, that she is spending her career with us so far here in Provo. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bailuna de Andrade. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for being here with me today. When I was preparing my presentation and thinking about all my previous research projects, I was thinking that maybe back in the day I should have pursued a degree in history and not in language and literature, because I am absolutely fascinated with human history. There are chapters of world history that horrify me, some chapters amaze me, most of them just intrigue me. It's commonly said that history is told by those who won the battle, by those who have power. And isn't it interesting when we have the opportunity to read an account provided by the other side? So in Brazil, we have this very important historical and literary document, the letter that was written by Pedro Vaz de Caminha to inform the King of Portugal about their discovery of the new continent. And they tell about the native people they find. And I always think it would be so illuminating if we could read about these encounters from the perspective of the native South Americans. But unfortunately, these voices have been lost or silenced. And then we have literature. And even though literature is not committed to verified or documented facts, it provides us with priceless opportunities to at least imagine how the world could have been or how it was from perspectives that have been silenced. My traje trajectory sorry, as a researcher demonstrates what literature is for me. It's a social praxis, a form of art that is motivated by social and cultural circumstances and a record that can help us better understand those conditions and ultimately even provoke change. As a PhD student and later as a postdoc fellow in Sao Paulo, I dedicated myself to learning about German writers who fled from Germany during the Nazi period, and they formed communities articulating resistance in many different places. Those exiled intellectuals faced all sorts of hardships, but still many of them continued to publish and get involved in discussions on how to denounce the horrors of National Socialism. They were using their writings to advocate for a much desired and needed change in society. <clears throat> they were trying to tell their truth about the Third Reich. And it's interesting to note that most of them published fiction. So instead of publishing a diary or an autobiography, they chose to fictionalize their experiences of oppression, persecution, violence, and exile. And that makes me wonder, what can fiction do that a nonfiction book cannot? <laughs> <laughs> 
how much farther or deeper can literature reach if we assume the author's intent to spread the word about certain events or experiences? And these questions are still on my mind in my current study of historical novels. When I came to BYU in 2019, I shifted my research agenda to Brazilian literature, but I did not entirely change my interests or my approach. I started looking at how contemporary literature depicts a period of violence and oppression, but in my country. The military dictatorship that took place in Brazil between 1964 and 1985. I wanted to understand why so many authors until today are still publishing novels that thematize that historical period, or at least books that have that context as backdrop. When the dictatorship in Brazil came to an end, all the accusations of threat and torture, people who mysteriously disappeared after being taken by the regime, People murdered in demonstrations, intellectuals persecuted and exiled, all that all was swept under the rug instead of investigated and judged. The perpetrators of all that violence were granted amnesty and a painful silence fell over that recent past. The collective trauma was never processed in the courts, but it is still being processed until today in the field of artistic and literary representation. So my readings of contemporary Brazilian literature investigating how violence and oppression have been portrayed in recent novels brought me to some authors who are not discussing the military dictatorship, but are also trying to uncover some of the silenced experiences of the country's past, the colonial past, which is my topic for today. Oh, I'm forgetting all my slides. Here are the German people and publications. And here are some of the publications in Brazil about the military dictatorship. <clears throat> Not that yet. So today we are going to start familiarizing ourselves with the tradition of historical novels in Brazil and observe how the genre has changed over the past 150 years. And then finally explore some recent novels that offer non-canonical perspectives of Brazil's colonial period. These new representations, in my view, they not only reveal historical facts under diverse lenses, but they have a lot to say about Brazil today, about our present. They meet very old demands for telling the story of millions of people belonging to historically marginalized groups. These groups, which include people from indigenous, African or Jewish origins, as well as women <clears throat> and non cisgender people. These people are usually absent or represented problematically in the novels from the 19th century. That's what we are going to see here today. But as the world shifted to the 20th century, both literary genres and society changed. Brazil changed. And the social climate we have nowadays is more accepting, actually more than accepting, of more inclusive artistic representations. It even demands these inclusive representations. So the books I will comment on in this presentation, I think, respond to these current trends and question the myth believed by many that Brazil is a racial democracy. Maybe you have heard about that, that everyone has equal opportunities, Race is not determinant of one's circumstances, and races live together in harmony. Walter Scott is usually considered the father of historical novels. The model that he established in the early 1800s is that of a narrative of a time previous to the writer's time that mentions historical events, that sometimes has historical characters as secondary characters, but the protagonists are fictional, as well as the plot. <clears throat> so the aesthetics of romanticism play an important role in the foundation of the genre. And the first historical novels we have in Brazil also follow these same modes and align with the country's romanticist traits, such as the search for a national identity, 
the formation of certain regions of the country, we will see that also today, and the esteem for values such as honor, bravery, purity, and others. So allow me to briefly comment on some of the publications that initiated the tradition of historical novels in Brazil. One of the first examples is this, As Tardes de um Pintor ou As Intrigas de um Jesuíta. That's the name of the book. It means The Evenings of an Artist or The Intrigues of a Jesuit. The author is Antonio Teixeira Souza. It was published in 1847 and present, presented an intricate plot of conspiracies and conflicts caused by a Jesuit priest who, unable to marry the woman of his desires, tries to take over control of her life by getting rid of her fiancé. The fictional characters and plot develop against a backdrop of colonial Brazil with its exploration expeditions known as bandeiras, the Jesuit missions that also were there at the time, and the presence of several ethnic groups, such as Portuguese immigrants, Jesuit priests, gypsies, enslaved Africans, and Brazilians, and I mean the descendants of the colonialists. I wish to highlight only one episode of this novel. So at a certain point of the story, <clears throat> there is a character who calls his recently enslaved, acquired slave named Apolinario, and he asks if he wants to be freed. But there was a price he would have to kill a man for his owner, and Apollinario agrees to that, but the action unfolds in a way that he's not, after all, required to kill anyone. But as we can see, Teixeira Souza depicted social conflicts in Brazil, as we expect he would, but he portrayed those enslaved as capable of doing anything to be free. His critical depictions of Catholic priests, as well as similar depictions that we have in other novels, it's interesting, but they deserve further thought and research, just not today. But the problem here for me is the fact that in the story, characters of Portuguese descent expect the enslaved African character to do their dirty work. They would not kill a man with their own hands, but the slave will do it. And we see a similar trend when a Romani character later in the story is also paid to do something criminal. A few years later, in 1865, José de Alencar published As Minas de Prata, or The Silver Mines. This author was not the first to publish works of historical nature in Brazil, but he was the first canonical author to do it. This narrative takes place, is set in the late 1500s, early 1600s in Salvador, and it centers on the legendary silver mines allegedly discovered by the late father of a character, Estácio Correia. This young man, this character, is impoverished in means, but he's rich in European manners and in courtly love. He reflects the romantic ideals of which Alan Carr was a fan. The main characters in this novel are all European, originating from a few noble families who led the colonization of Brazil with their, and I quote, their pure Andalusian blood and their saudades do Minho, meaning they missed Portugal. Other characters are the Jesuit priests who also conspired to find the valuable mines. And there are very few references to other social groups, including a servant of a wealthy lady who is, whom the narrator simply calls the Black Lucas, and one or two others of less established origins. Let's take a look, for example, at the description that we have of an 18-year-old mulatto girl. And if I may ask, how many of you here speak Portuguese? Ah, a considerable number. Okay, so maybe I'll read the original, and you have the translation here, okay? Era um tipo brasileiro, cruzamento de três raças, americano nas formas, africano no sangue, europeu na gentileza. O moreno suave das faces, os grandes olhos negros e rasgados, os dentes alvos engaçados no sorriso lascivo, o requebro lânguido e sensual do porte sedutor 
Sob o traje oriental, davam liares de verdadeira sultana. This passage shows the exoticism and sensuality with which the Brazilian woman is described and the attributes she inherits from each of her mixed origins. <clears throat> it results in a feast for the male gaze. The representation of colonial Brazil in Alencar's novel is that of a circle of Europeans seeking enrichment in the exuberant, undiscovered nature of the new continent, but who wish to preserve their Iberian values, customs, fashions, and feelings. One last traditional example I would like to comment on is Erico Verissimo's classic, O Tempo e o Vento, or Time and the Wind. The first volume, O Continente, was published in, the in 1949, so the aesthetic had long ceased to be that of romanticism. And the story told is specifically that of Rio Grande do Sul, a state in southern Brazil. It starts with the seven peoples of the missions, a group of villages formed by, missionary, by Catholic priests, missionaries, and catechized indigenous. The narrative begins in 1745 and ends in the 1830s, around the Farroupilha Revolution. And who are the main characters of the story of Rio Grande do Sul? The Jesuits, some immigrants from Sao Paulo of Portuguese origins, and other immigrants of Azorian and German origins. So it's from the perspective of the European immigrant that this Brazilian story is told. Little attention is paid to characters of indigenous origin. For example, the legendary indigenous warrior Sepe Tiaraju is just briefly mentioned in the first chapter. And the indigenous people of Father Alonso's mission, they are all civilized and Christianized to the point of fanaticism. Pedro Missioneiro, who plays a more important role in the story, is almost infantilized in his gentle and unintelligible ways. And what about Africans and Afro-Brazilians in the, in the novel? They only appear on some very rare occasions, briefly mentioned just as slaves or victims of overt racism of some characters. There is another priest in the story named Padre Lara that when he's thinking about Rodrigo's extramarital affair, he's not scandalized by the adultery, by the, but by the fact that the girl, the young lady, is almost mulatto. I think these three examples give us a general idea of how the tradition of historical novels in Brazil was established, how it told the country's history. The aesthetics follow European models, the main characters are European in origin, and the historical events revisited are those relevant to the colony's establishment and the consolidation of colonizers as the dominant social group. Many historians have discussed how both the present and the hegemonic narratives influence the discourse of history. Paul Vane described history as a projection of our own values and the questions we want to ask. For him, every description of a certain historical period is selective, and the truth of history is partial. As we cannot describe the totality of past events, lives, or societies, Vane considered history an open field with countless possibilities for new perspectives and new versions of the past to be retold. Antonio Esteves, who authored one of the most comprehensive studies of historical novels in Brazil, he criticizes these narratives that reproduce stereotypes, that privilege foundation myths and national utopias, and pretend the sad and embarrassing aspects of our history never happened. Specifically discussing Brazilian history, Emilia Viotti da Costa highlights the two-way relation of a better understanding of the past leading to a better understanding of the present and vice versa. She remarks, As marcas que nos ficaram como um legado do regime servil e que transcenderam sua época chegando até nós, imprimiram aspectos peculiares à nossa sociedade. A concentração de negros e mestiços, 
os problemas de sua marginalidade, a questão do preconceito racial, as dificuldades para integração e adaptação dos descendentes dos escravos, tudo isso deriva do passado próximo, cujo conhecimento é essencial para a compreensão dos fenômenos atuais. Viotti da Costa adds that the end of the colonial system in Brazil is a long process that in some respects is still in progress nowadays. Depictions of the colonial period in historical novels from the 19th and 20th centuries, as well as its portrayal in recently published novels of historical nature, I think they reflect this ongoing process. And with the examples I'm going to share now, I hope to demonstrate that Brazilian contemporary literature, a disputed field for cultural expression and the shaping of national identities, is one of the social platforms for reclaiming silenced discourses and increasing representation of women and Afro-Brazilians among other groups. So let's jump ahead to the 21st century and find the novels by Eliana Alves Cruz. Her historical novels was, were published in 2015, 18, and 20. The author has established herself on the Brazilian scene as a major contributor to Afro-Brazilian literature, but besides historical novels, she also published poems, short stories, screenplays, and other novels that are not historical. <clears throat> In comparing her titles, Água de Barrela, O Crime do Cais do Valongo, and Nada Digo de Ti Quem Ti Não Veja, to the more traditional historical novels, I want to highlight the role of African and Afro-Brazilian women in the development of these narratives as they reclaim their voice in these stories and in history. The narratives are permeated by the violence of the historical processes represented. And by violence, we could take different definitions here. I use this one from Jaime Ginsburg, who defines it as that which implies physical violence and intentionality. For him, O reconhecimento do problema social da violência pode surgir de modo muito nítido em momentos posteriores a episódios de genocídios. Quando vemos em um cinema, ou pela televisão, ou pessoalmente, as ruínas e os cadáveres de um ato de extermínio assombroso, a violência pode dar lugar a uma forma de melancolia coletiva. A não aceitação da perda pode levar a uma rejeição da realidade imediata, é uma relação tensa da sociedade consigo mesma. The violence of the enslavement processes used in the colonization of Brazil is not there for us to see in person or on television, but in the ruins they left behind. And what are those ruins, the exclusionary structures that still make Brazil a place of inequality and racial injustice? As Brazilian historian Lydia Schwartz says, our present is really full of the past. Our present, yeah. So let's look at Eliana Alves Cruz's first novel, Água de Barrela. The book contains many photographs and images, as well as a family tree, linking the characters in the novel to the author's own family, giving the narrative historical weight and authenticity. At first, the characters are on the Nossa Senhora da Natividade plantation in Bahia, and although the narrator also traces the family history of the plantation owners and comments on the elite of that region, it actually centers on the challenges and violence suffered by the enslaved people on the property. Some of the stories about their happy days in Africa, the kidnapping, the transatlantic journey, the purchase, and the adaptation to their new situation are retold. Each stage of the story is permeated with abuses and reactions, impressions, and well-constructed subjectivities. They are not, as in traditional narratives, simply black people or Africans or slaves. No, they are individuals with a history of resistance and a network of mutually supportive relationships. When the young character Eva Oluva dies in childbirth, she leaves behind her baby Anolina, who is cared for by Umbelina and does do as if she were of their own blood. These women support and care for each other during every stage of their lives. 
when Annalena is given as a treat to the colonel's son at the age of 14, it is from those women that she gets the strength to endure the humiliating sexual exploitation that she's forced to experience. When the girl was still a baby, Umbelina took it upon herself to keep the faith and tradition of her ancestors alive and consecrated Annalena to Oya, an entity from African religious tradition. The novel says the following regarding their trips to the Tejero, hidden from the owners of the farm. It was a long journey, which had to be done in parts, as they couldn't leave the mill for long periods, but which resulted in more unity between them and a sense of how to endure so many trials in a single lifetime. With the abolition of slavery in 1888, the characters gained new opportunities to support each other in their quest for self-reliance. They work, they fall in love, they have children and grandchildren, they sell sweets on the streets, they cultivate their lands, they go to school, <clears throat> and they lead their lives and their families as best they can. Their, re their leading role is even admired by a rich young feminist, Lily Tosta, who comments to her mother about her admiration for Damiana's family. Damiana is Anolina's granddaughter. So Marta, Damiana, Maria da Gloria, Nunu, and so many others. It's through the lineage of women that Eliana Alves Cruz's novel places the history of Brazil along the paths of those who were once enslaved, but who later built the country with their work, with their affections, their religiosity, and their wisdom. The novel O Crime do Cais do Valongo is also about the intelligence of African women. The narrative is divided between two voices. We have a free man, Nuno Moutinho, who is investigating the murder of the slave traver, Bernardo Viana, and we have the young enslaved woman, Moana Lomoe, who belonged to the dead man. In the construction of this character, I would like to highlight the voice through which she conducts the narrative. And more than that, she conveys her story to an interlocutor, the English abolitionist Mr. Toole. So Moana recounts her abduction from Mozambique, recalls the history of her people and the landscape of her land. She reflects on the differences between Christian religiosity and the beliefs and traditions of her people. She finds the patriarchal organization of colonial society strange in comparison to her own, which is matriarchal. She analyzes her reality and the processes by which her freedom and her life were taken from her and from so many others. The young woman affirms her identity. I am a Makua Lomue. And she hides the fact that she is literate for her own protection and advantage. The construction of such a character breaks with a traditionally limiting representation of hegemonic discourse, which relegates African peoples to a culturally and intellectually inferior position. Moana has the voice, the story, and at the end of the novel, she has the control over her life. The other narrator, Nuno Moutinho, <clears throat> at the end of his investigation, observes Moana and her fellow enslaved friends, Mariano and Rosa, and comes to his first conclusion, which is, the three of them had more power than the intendant. And where did this power come from? In Moana's words, our greatest strength was their disbelief in what we could and could not learn and create. Another character by Elvis Cruz has similar control and industriousness, this time in the novel Nada de Gudici, Quem Te Não Veja. Vitória is a character of great interest, not only in this novel, but in the set of characters created by Elvis Cruz, because of the multiple transgressions of the established order that she commits, and also to be able, for being able to guard herself against the violence directed at her by the religious order. In a historical context of rigid control of behavior, including sexual behavior, Vitoria dares to identify herself as a woman, she is transgender, and conquer her freedom through her cleverness and artifices that are partly unknown to the reader. She was known as a mandingueira, or as they used to say, calunduzeira, meaning a healer with mystical abilities. 
She was always impeccably t clean and tidy, and many turned to her for her power to cure. Despite the accusations she suffers in the story at the end of the narrative, the narrator who calls itself time only reveals that Vittoria had escaped from prison, and we don't know anything else about her. Another character in Nada Digo de Ti is Quiteria. She was raised in the Muniz household, and she's described as so skillful and so beautiful. This young woman is victim of the jealousy and malice of Sinha Aninha. Even so, the girl who preserves her faith in the Orishas despite the prohibitions does not become hardened or bitter by the, injustice, the injustices she has suffered, but keeps her hope and purity of character during the narrative until her companion manages to buy her freedom. Like Iteria, it's distinctive of the characters in Elian Alves Cruz historical novels that they do not bow down or surrender to the evil of that universe of daily violence so skillfully reconstructed by the author who is a journalist and does extensive archival research in preparation to write her novels. These women figures in a new representation of Brazilian history retain their character, their affability among their affections, their values, and their faith. They respond to the desire of the Afro-Brazilian majority of the population for a representation of the country's history that does justice and gives dignity to such decisive characters, both fictional and historical. Eliana Alves Cruz's historical novels, therefore, not only reconstruct Brazil's past, but are also the flagship of a change in the scores and paradigm underway in our society. <clears throat> which is becoming more open to new perspectives, different voices, and other narratives. At the same time, such novels are also more realistic in the sense that they depict conflicts and nuanced perspectives not presented in the traditional historical novels. Fernando Novaes, a Brazilian historian, observes that colonial society is often and mistakenly seen as stable under the patriarchal do domain, but the relations between workers in servitude and farm owners were actually under constant tension. He points to slave labor as the distinctive mark of our social formation, one that not only prevails in the productive system, but also shapes social relations and structures. Such complexities are more likely to be represented in recent historical novels than in the old ones. It seems the trend in our literary panorama is to no longer fear conversations centered on the uncomfortable facts of our history. And as I'm speaking of a trend, I should bring more evidence, but I will just mention that several other writers have presented the Brazilian reader with narrators and protagonists belonging to social groups that were not commonly featured in historical novels from the 18 and 1900s, such as women and children of African descent and others. Ana Maria Gonçalves, Mariana Chazanas, Américo Antunes, Maria José Silveira, Ana Miranda are some of the writers participating in this movement, advocating for a critical revision of the fictionalized narratives from the colonial past in Brazil. The myth of racial democracy in the country reinforced by literature that often ignores class and race tensions in the past has been debunked by a social climate of acknowledgement of such conflicts and the literary scene reflects these new readings of our history. Whereas European perspectives were the norm in the so-called classics of the genre of historical novel novels, writers from this day are creating fictional reconstructions of colonial times much more consistent with the diversity of social groups composing the society of the day. And they are offering us, the audience, the chance to imagine what it would have been like to live in the shoes of those that hegemonic history discourse does not frequently remember. And I'll stay here and let's see what you want to know about it furtherly. All right, well, I'm gonna kick it off with one question. Uh, I know that some folks in the room here uh, have studied Brazilian literature, which is a marvelous thing to study. 
but for those of us that haven't, uh, and we're intrigued by your presentation, uh, what would be a good way to start? So how, how might um, one of us that has not studied Brazilian literature uh, engage with this literature um, as, a, as a newcomer? Okay. So first let me admit that before starting this research project, I didn't have clearly in mind that Brazilian had such a strong tradition of historical novels. My impression is that we had a few here, a few there, but not really a tradition. And then when I had the chance, so for example, this past summer, I had the chance to visit an archive in Sao Paulo, the Biblioteca Brasiliana, and also the library in the Brazilian Studies Institute. And then I found some, most, some of the oldest publications in this genre, that I had no idea they existed. So many questions come to our minds, like why? Nobody knows about them nowadays. <laughs> Is it because they are not worthy reading or not? So as I said, we have some canonical authors from the past that wrote historical novels. And I like to do this chronological trajectory of seeing how, it's, how the past was depicted in the 1900s and then nowadays, and what it changed. If a student comes to me and asks for suggestions, I think I'm going to suggest some of the most recent ones. Maybe for obvious reasons, that they, <laughs> they are going to be more instructive in teaching them not only about Brazilian literature, but also about Brazilian history, even though, as I said, literature doesn't have that commitment to the truth. But I think these ones that we have nowadays, they're able to raise questions not only about the past, but also about the present. And we can become aware of things that are going on in our society nowadays, reading these historical novels. So I think some of those that I, some of those authors that I showed in my, my last slide are a good starting point for someone who wants to have a better idea of what a historical novel from Brazil is like. Okay. Any other questions? Hi, my name's Ashley. I'm a psych major, but I was just curious what other things you want to see happen as a result of these more accurate histories being done, like changes in schools, how they teach, or just anything that you hope to see or have already started to see based on this more correct version yeah. of history. Thanks. That's an interesting question, because some years ago, there was a change in educational laws in Brazil that were trying to, well, I don't know if that's the right verb, but they were trying to, yeah, not force, but encourage teachers in education to include Afro-Brazilian history, Afro-Brazilian culture, Afro-Brazilian literature to their curriculums. So I think this change is already underway for the same reason that we have this change in literature, because that's something our society has been wanting and needing for a long time. So I think what I can anticipate from my research is that more and more I'm going to see the connection between the literature that is produced and the social and even anthropological aspects of the society of this day. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Jordan Jones. I'm a faculty member in Spanish and Portuguese as well. I wanted to ask you a question about um, identity of the writers and what they write about. So it seems like in, you know, in your talk, you talk about um, those who write about the dictatorship. And I, I know, I'm, from what I understand, many of them are children of people mm -hmm. who were exiled or who were impacted very, very directly by the dictatorship, um, and Eliana Alves Cruz being, you know, in her, in Agua de Bahia, she, she connects herself to 
uh, generations of enslaved people. And so I, I guess I'm wondering to what extent a, an author or what your sense is for Eliana Alvis Cruz or other authors in terms of deciding on a topic that needs to be maybe not rewritten but explored more thoroughly and, well, I have a connection here, so that would act, add weight to my narrative, or I have nothing to do with this period, but I still think it's interesting, so I'm going to write about it either way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't think that happens always, but yes, many times what we see moving a writer is some sort of generational trauma, if I can call that. We have other concepts when we are talking about the military dictatorship. But I can see clearly why they are motivated to write about these things and why they are personally invested in helping to bring these changes to our society. I think it's interesting because, well, as a scholar choosing to write about those topics, I'm obviously not processing any generational trauma, but history can become very personal to me also in another sense, but let me not deviate so much about what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so I think that's not exclusive to this phenomenon that we are seeing here. I think that if we investigate an author's life, at least from these that are more present in media and that are presenting their ideas and taking a stance in society, we can clearly see why they want that change to happen. And it's interesting to note that these authors, they are authors, as you saw, the majority of the ones that I showed here are black women. They are forming a growing group of authors who are occupying a space in Brazilian liter literature that a few decades ago was not occupied by them. We have research showing, even quantitative research showing, that the profile of the Brazilian writer and also of the protagonists was usually what? White males from the South and Southeast, highly educated, usually employed in journalism or higher education, and not to our surprise, protagonists also aligned with that profile. But from 10 years to now, maybe you can help me with those numbers, because I know you have read those articles too. <laughs> we are seeing an exponential growth in the number of publications by black authors in Brazil. And I bet that there has been an increase in general in numbers of publications, but by the fact that this ethnic group is not staying behind, I think it shows a good tendency in that sense. Thanks for your presentation, Patricia. Sure. My name is Emran Estlin. I'm in the English department. I wondered if you could talk to us about the place of the genre of the historical novel, um, you know, late 19th century until now. Is it a popular genre that's read by a lot of people? Is it a genre that's taught much, at, you know, if you're a high school student in Brazil, you are reading this genre. If you're a college student, are you reading in this genre? Where does that genre fit in what a, let's say, literate Brazilian would be reading mm -hmm. back then and now? Uh -huh. I think I can talk from my experience. And as I said, being born and raised in Brazil and having all my education in Brazil, I was not familiar to that strong tradition. So what we know is, for example, in the 1800s, during Romanticism, there were the first ones that are still known to the larger audience nowadays. And those works, I think they aligned with what Romanticism was trying to do, that was to, to define a national identity. So looking back at the past and trying to elect national symbols and national heroes even so, that made sense at the time. So that's why the first canonical, canonical historical novels we have are from Romanticism. But I think nowadays, with this surge in numbers of works being published by authors who are engaged in discussions with the society, I hope it gets more known to the public. I don't think students at schools are reading historical novels 
by now, but maybe in the future. Hopefully not too far from here. <laughs> Any other? You don't want to hear about my personal experience with history? Yes, please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anne. I'm a political science major and a women's studies minor. And maybe this is really pessimistic to assume that there has been some, but I'm just wondering, like, has there been, like, pushback on this movement and some sort of, like, kind of negative reaction that leans more into kind of that cleaner, less diverse narrative, and mm -hmm. what has that pushback looked like? Uh -huh. I don't think there has been any negative pushback against the authors by the community of authors. Maybe there has been some negative, some pushback against changes in curriculum. People are discussing that all the time. I do remember only a few months ago, so in Brazil, when you want to get admitted to a university, you have to take this very long test. And part of this test, for part of this test, you have to read some certain novels. And I do remember one of the most important universities in Brazil changed their reading list. And they said, OK, for three years, we're only going to read novels by women writers. And that raised a huge discussion on, OK, so you were trying to force diversity, and not that's not how it happens. I think we can see a stronger pushback in political actions in, for example, what, how do you call that here? Ações afirmativas? Affirmative actions. I think that will obviously raise more pushback. But I think inside the community of authors, I don't think people think they are losing space for other authors, but maybe yeah, in curricular choices, that could be the case. I do see some controversy in that field. <laughs> Um, I'm Maddie. I'm an English major. Um, I know we're discussing Brazil specifically, but I was wondering if you're aware of any trends in historical novels in other areas of Latin America as well, or even in other countries that are also um, grappling, I guess, with the mm -hmm. legacies of colonialism. Yeah. I have not studied a lot about it, but I read a couple articles that were commenting on how historical novels in Latin America have changed, especially in the aesthetic aspect of it. So they moved very far from that model established by Walter Scott along the 20th century. And the authors in Latin America have been experimenting with the forms of the novel a lot more, I think, even more than they have been doing in Brazil. But yeah, I'm sorry, I can't go too much deep in it. I am Ethan. I'm a geography and Portuguese studies major. How would you explain the shift that has occurred recently in Brazil that's created a space for more women and um, authors of color to be able to put forth their works? What kind of has allowed that to happen in recent years that hasn't happened in the hundreds of years of Brazilian history before? That's a great question, Ethan. So. I think in the past maybe 30 or 40 years, we have seen this change has been a lot more visible than it had been years before. And I can tell you for sure if it was the political regime that kept things going a bit more conservative in general in society. And after the re-democratization of the country, a space was open for other kinds of changes too. That's just a hypothesis. But I think this shift is also shown in other aspects of society. For example, how people were voting. And I don't know, even I believe we can see that shift happening in other countries too. Maybe that's not exclusive to Brazil. But I think in Brazil it has happened in the past for decades, and it might be linked to a desire for a change and democratization, not only of politics, but also of culture that has been in place, maybe. I don't know. 
<laughs> just guessing. 